morning. Uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Seneca Falls. Uh, it's a beautiful morning out there. Uh, let's go before the Lord this morning and just ask him to bless our time. Father, we thank you for the uh, technology, Lord, to still meet. Uh, even when we're not in person, Lord, we know we're united in spirit. We pray that you would do that this morning as your word and as we worship together as the body of Christ, Lord, that um, you would unify us, being of one spirit and one mind, Lord, uh, because of that spirit. So we just uh, continue to praise you as we, um, coming out of last week's Easter celebration, Lord, we continue to recognize uh, what you did there on the cross for us, Lord, and we continue to praise you for that because you're worthy of it. Um, we uh, give you this time this morning in your name. Amen. Let's uh, sing victory in Jesus together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me and bought me with his redeeming blood. honestly and uh, Pastor Ray just left the room so I'm going to make the executive decision and we're going to continue to worship the Lord this morning and uh, just praise him for that victory by his stripes 
we are healed by his nail piercings we're free by his blood we're washed clean now we have the victory Jesus overcame it all. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won it all.
Father, thank you for being risen, Lord, for who you are and what you did for us, Lord. Um, the only thing we can do in response to that, Lord, is offer you our hearts, God, as you call us to surrender to you.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening
Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Your grace is found. This is where you are. And where you are. comes my way when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you Oh, my soul, worship this holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Well, Father, we do need you this morning, Lord, as we need you every morning, every moment, God. It's that need that when we realize we need you so badly, Lord, that we demand that our soul cries out to you and blesses you, Lord, for how good you are to us. Uh, in light of that need, God, that you would come to earth to win the victory for us, God, because of that need for you, that you would sacrifice so much for us. So, Father, we praise you for that. Uh, we praise you for what you're doing during this time, God, um, in our hearts and in our lives and in the people around us, God, for the hearts that are opening. Um, we just pray that you would be at work in us, that we would be yielded to your spirit, God, and ready to hear what you have from your word, Lord, for us today. And we uh, are ready to praise you for the things that you are doing in these hard circumstances, God, because you are still worthy of the praise. You are still worthy of being blessed by our souls, God, despite our circumstances, despite what's going around us, God. You've already won the victory. You've done enough for us. So we praise you for that this morning, God. And uh, we pray, pray that you would um, be with Pastor Ray as he opens your word and uh, that your spirit would speak to us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, Jonathan mentioned earlier that we're so thankful that we have this media to be able to play um, the worship and to be able to give the messages um, and it's certainly not the same as everyone being here, 
but it is a blessing that we're able to do that. And uh, I guess God is helping us to practice our patience, isn't he? Uh, Helping us to put things in their proper perspective, particularly the eternal perspective. Uh, Just so glad that you can all be joining us through video. Uh, We're especially pleased to welcome uh, those that might be visitors that don't come to our fellowship that maybe have discovered uh, that we have our worship service on Facebook during this time and we're, we're just blessed for all of you that are here and that are able to join us and worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Um, I just have a couple of announcements and I'm going to do things a little differently. I'm going to uh, do the um, reading and then I'm going to also read our text back to back and then we'll pray once uh, for God to um, help us to honor his word and, and to look at what we need to see this morning. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say that I still am having some people that are asking about you know, uh, their tithes and offerings. You know, Can we just mail it? Of course you can mail it. The address is 2291 Route 89. And of course, Seneca Falls, uh, New York with 13148. And you can make your checks out. If you're making a check out, you can make it to uh, CCSF, Calvary Chapel, Seneca Falls. You don't have to write the whole thing out. I'm, that's not a big deal. But uh, y- you can write Calvary Chapel, Seneca Falls, or just CCSF. Uh, but the address, again, is 2291 Route 89 in Seneca Falls. So uh, I just wanted to clear that up because we're still getting people that are maybe a little confused about that. And... Uh, The second thing I want to talk about is um, we have our prayer meeting tonight, and I I know that um, it's usually a a smaller group that comes out, and we're going to take a chance here and just say, look, if you want to be joining us tonight, uh, you have to either get an email or a phone call to uh, Pastor Nick Schamberger, and uh, you can text him or email him. Uh, his number is 315-577-2926. So uh, he's got to know that in order that he can send you an invitation to the um, Google Hangout is what the way we've been doing it. Um, as opposed to the Zoom, I know we've been doing other things on Zoom, so don't confuse the two. But once you get the invitation, it's it's pretty easy to just respond to that and I think we can talk you through if you get on there and there's any trouble. Uh, seems like uh, every time I get on the internet, there's a little bit of trouble, but that's just because of me. And, you know, we need to be praying for our leaders, um, our church leaders, but also our civil leaders. I know that uh, many of the governors are struggling with, you know, when to allow states and counties to come back, and uh, certainly we've got a very... Uh, difficult situation here in New York because we got hit so hard, but we need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be praying uh, also for salvation for those that don't know the Lord, and uh, we just want to make sure that we're uh, keeping all the things in their proper perspective. It's easy to get upset. Um, I got upset once um, let's see, five years ago. No, we, we, we can get upset very easily, can't we? Because things aren't going the way we want them to go or they're not going uh, along in the time that, um, the time frame that we wish it was going into. You know, we can be thinking about uh, men in the Bible and women in the Bible that spent time alone with the Lord and um, where God had an opportunity to really get a hold of their hearts. I think, you know, of Moses, 40 years on the backside of the desert. Moses was tending sheep, and uh, the Lord did great things, of course, with and through Moses. But it wasn't until after uh, 40 years of hanging out with God in the desert. And then he got called to deliver the children of Israel. Joseph, of course, some 8 to 10 years in prison. Uh, for doing what was right, had the opportunity to uh, shine his light for the Lord, and he did. Uh, Paul, of course, three years in Arabia. Um, Imagine, I can't imagine, Paul coming into fellowships, coming into synagogues where the believers had 
family members that had been killed and Paul being responsible for their death. I imagine going into church and you're the guy that had, you know, my spouse or my children uh, killed or my parents and uh, forgiving. Uh, so that, that time and even John on the Isle of Patmos when he was exiled there and he, we got the book of Revelation as a result of that. So uh, this is a time of introspection for all of us and a time where we can take advantage of the fact that we have some extra time. I know it's a little chaotic, a little hectic, but we're able to do those things. So just, I think that's it for announcements. I'm not sure if anybody has anything, but um, we can always get it through the email if you do. So I want to read um, our reading from today, for today, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, one that we're quite familiar with. And it is in verse 14 of chapter 6 through chapter 7, verse 1. Second, did I say 1 Corinthians? No, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I just want to make one comment on verse 16 when he says that for you are the temple of the living God. Uh, remember, it was Jesus himself that when he was with the disciples in chapter 14 of John's gospel that he told them that my father and I, if you come to us, we will make our home in you. Uh, I, I, this always blows my mind that the, the Trinity gets together and decides that the Father and I, in other words, the Holy Spirit, would come in and indwell us so that we constantly have not only the companionship, but the wisdom and direction of God. Um, if you would turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. I think it was about three weeks ago that we were in chapter 1, but we were in verses 5 through, excuse me, 3 through 5 or 6 in that area. But today, this morning, I'd like to look with you at verses 13 through 16, and then I'm going to read after verses 13 through 16, verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2, and verses 11 and 12. So, in First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter writes, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then finally, verses 11 and 12. 
in chapter 2 of Peter. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, in other words, foreigners, aliens, our citizenship is not here on earth, it's in heaven. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look at this section or these sections of Scripture, we begin to already realize that you want us to search our hearts, as it says in Psalm 139. Search my heart and see if there be any way, wicked way in me. In fact, it really should be written, since there are so many wicked ways in us, in that life that, that we still have that old man, that nature of the flesh. Lord, we desire that you would work in our hearts this morning. Work in our hearts in holiness that we would desire to be drawing near to you and much closer walking with you day by day. We ask you to um, allow your Holy Spirit now, wherever we might find ourselves, in our living room, wherever we're watching this, in this sanctuary as we few are gathered together. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come into this place of our heart and give us understanding in the word for you truly are the one that interprets the word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we began this series of messages four weeks ago today. And we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at God's desire for us to bring the gospel as ambassadors for Christ. And, and that was all the way back, I think, on the 22nd of March. Not that far back, but four weeks ago. And then we, the following week, we did a message uh, from 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, called Our Living Hope. And these were a great preview as we were approaching Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday last week. And that we have an inheritance that is incorruptible. It's waiting for us. It can't be defiled. And that will never fade away. It's reserved in heaven for all of us who believe and know the Lord. We, we contrasted our blessed hope and our eternal perspective with the world's lost condition and hopeless situation apart from God. And then after that, Palm Sunday, we discussed particularly, you know, I, when I think of Palm Sunday, I always think of Daniel 9.25 and the prophecy 483 years before Jesus came in to ride in the, on that donkey, 483 years to the day the prophet, or I should say the prophets, declared that that would be the very day. In fact, in Psalm 118, which we're very familiar with, and we sing this song, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is believed to be referring to the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. And so we celebrated um, that Palm Sunday, but we, we gave it, a, a, you know, we the angle that we came from is that, that the God's desire was to reach not only Israel, but all nations. So we tried to connect that understanding to the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, we were able to show how the Bible is so connected, Old Testament, New Testament, and that it's not two separate books. The Bible is one book with 66 chapters, in a sense. You know, because there's 66 books altogether. And then finally, of course, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ last Sunday, pausing, of course. Uh, we, we paused to 
uh, losing my place here, um, pausing on Good Friday to realize the cup of wrath that our blessed Savior drank in our stead and for our eternal life. And of course, Resurrection Sunday is the pinnacle of the Christian celebration for if Christ doesn't come out of the tomb, we have no hope at all. We're to be pitied, as Paul says in, res in uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, above all men. But because he was indeed raised, verse 20 in chapter 15, because he was indeed raised, the sacrifice of the lamb accepted by God in heaven, we shout hallelujah and remember with great passion, don't we, the triumph in which we rejoice. It's a day on our calendar that's like no other. Uh, though we celebrate the event um, every single day in our lives as Christians. But there's something very special for us on Easter Sunday morning, and words cannot entirely express it. So we find ourselves this Sunday, one week after Resurrection Sunday, saying, so where do we go from here? What do we do? I mean, we're all excited on Easter Sunday morning, but what is that supposed to lead us to if anyone hasn't noticed we're not in heaven yet <laughs> since last week the rapture hasn't come and that might be much to our chagrin but the fact is we're still here and god has work for us to do so um now what what does god what is our response to this tremendous celebration going forward you know consider 1 Corinthians 15 in verse um, 58, the very last verse, which we did not read last week. We were in verses 12 through 23 pri principally, and we were dealing with uh, the, the Corinthians saying that there was no resurrection. But if we look at the last verse, it says this, and you don't have to turn. Therefore, this is the very last verse of the... Uh, famous 1 Corinthians 15 resurrection chapter right after Paul quotes from the Old Testament book of Hosea, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God, it should end right there. <laughs> it doesn't. There's one more verse and that's what we want to focus on. What does he want now? Therefore, and we know why therefore is there. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, unshakable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, here it is, that your labor, by the way, that word means labor to the point of exhaustion. Some of you are feeling that even now. We're laboring to the point of exhaustion. Some of that is emotional and spiritual labor. Knowing, that word knowing is an experiential knowing. You, you have come to realize that your labor to the point of exhaustion is not in vain in the Lord. Wow. I'm awfully glad of that. Because sometimes I do labor to exhaustion, and so do many of you. And I'm glad that the Bible says that it's not going to be in vain. Nobody is going to be sorry that they labored to exhaustion for the Lord. Because we know in the scriptures, particularly in 1 Corinthians, that we will receive reward for those things that are done for Christ. Those things are the things which will last now, how does God suggest that we do this? Um, I mean, there's a lot of trouble. There's a lot of tribulation in this world. We're going through some of it right now. Other places around the world are going through more than we're going through. Many places. Many of our brothers and sisters would give anything to be here in America right now, living in the situation that we're in, compared to some of the persecuted church around the world. God's asking us to undertake a monumental, a monumental, and without him, otherwise impossible task 
But of course, the scripture says that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. What is God expecting from his people? What is he expecting from you and from me, from his saints, those who are born again of his spirit? And we hope you are born of his spirit. And if you're not, we'll talk about that later. You can have that opportunity right now to do that. I don't believe God wants us to waste any of the excitement that he has refreshed us so in the last couple of days. And I would submit to you this morning, I would suggest to you that verses 13 through 16 here in 1 Peter chapter 1 give us a hint to the answer to that question. This is certainly not a time for us to sit back, kick back and relax, is it? It's a time for us to be in prayer. It's a time for us to uh, be doing what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly. It's interesting that that verse has that word in uh, verse 58. He says, uh, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. But I would suggest to you that verses 13 through 16 give us a hint to this. This is certainly not a time for us to uh, coast. Not just because of coronavirus, but because of the condition of the rest of the world that most of the people in the world don't know Jesus. And that's why we're still here. Here's the first two chapters of Peter's first epistle. And in these, we see at least part of the solution for us as Christians. Jesus told us to go out into the world and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was the commission that was given to the disciples in Matthew 28 at the last few verses. And he passed that authority on to the disciples there. And now, of course, he's passed it on to us. And I believe that the secret to the success of that venture can be found, at least in part, here in verses, verse 16 of 1 Peter chapter 1. And what does it say in verse 16? Because it is written, he's speaking to the saints, you be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He talks about our conduct in verse 11, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from all fleshly lusts, I'm sorry, verse 12, which war against the soul, verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Interesting. Among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Um, your conduct. I was thinking about that. And it's interesting. It always seems to come back to my conduct when I'm reading through the Bible particularly through the Gospels and the Epistles in the New Testament. My behavior, which inevitably originates from what? My thoughts, what I'm thinking, and how I think. What do I really believe? Remember, as we've been saying over the past several years, we will always, and I really am so firmly convinced of this, we will always end up doing that which we truly believe. How do I know? You know, I think about that with electing officials. When you go to the polls, you go to the elections, uh, how do you vote for people? Not by what they tell you. How do you vote for a politician? It's very easy. See what they vote for. You, you can find out what they agree with and what they disagree with, and that's how, as a Christian, we should be looking at elections, right? We should be looking at the, at the, at the man who's going to come as close to what we believe and what God says as possible. It's not rocket science. You just have to see how they vote. It, it, it doesn't help us to listen to what they say. We have to see what they actually do. And, as I said, 
we always end up doing that which we truly believe. I mean, ultimately, my behavior will reveal that which I believe in my heart. So God says that we will be holy. I love this. Be holy, for I am holy. He's not saying, you better be holy. He's saying, if you're in Christ, if you're really a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe the truth of the gospel, you will be made holy. In fact, that's God's purpose for us in our life. He's conforming us, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So, be holy for I am holy. Peter says that that's what's written in the scripture. Where did Peter get that? Well, he gets it from the Old Testament. Just like we talked about when we were talking about uh, the, the resurrection and just like when we talked about Palm Sunday and just about God's ultimate goal, it's always been the same. He's always wanted to reach out to the nations. He, he, he says that it, it's what's written in the Old Testament scriptures. God isn't saying that you better be holy. He's saying, God is saying that he is holy and so it is inevitable that you shall be holy for that is the end of of the process. Again, Romans 8, 29, conforming us. That's ultimately what's going to take place. Where does that find its fulfillment? In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, you know, he says everyone that has this hope purifies himself, the hope in him purifies himself, even as he, Jesus, is pure. But the verse before that is, Dear children, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when we see him, we will see him as he is, and we shall be like him. First uh, Corinthians, what is it, 13, 12, says, now we see, while we're here living on this earth, we see through a glass darkly. I love that, that King James version. Or in like a mirror, a foggy mirror. We don't have a clear, the clearest picture. We, we, we see as in a glass a dark glass darkly but then when we come to him when the when the rapture comes when the trumpet sounds and we get translated and we get transformed in our bodies that's what the bible says in romans that we're waiting for he says when we see him we will be like him wow uh, I think we have to keep that in the forefront of our mind as we're going through this life, especially when we're in trials, to see how that really works. Where does that come from? I want to show you where it comes from. Uh, turn to Leviticus chapter 19. So this is all the way back in the law. God is talking about this holiness, this separateness. The word holy uh, in the Greek is hagias. Uh, basically, it's it means consecrated or to be separate. Well, we just read from 2 Corinthians chapter five, uh, chapter 6, verses 14 through the end of that chapter, and it talked about not being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It talked about what does Christ have to do with Belial? What does darkness have to do with light? So hagios simply means separate. And in the Hebrew, it's kadosh. We even sing a song about that. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. We haven't done it in a long time. It's the holy one. It means to be set apart. Now, ultimately and initially, this separateness or being separate has to do with creator God versus creation, which was created by God. So, you know, it's very clear that there is one God. It's very clear that God is not part of his creation because God created everything that we see, men, women, children, uh, planets, stars, universe. So we have creator, and we have that very separate. He is very separate from his creation. And so that's the initial understanding. But then it carries forward to God's people but first in Israel and then from Israel comes the Messiah and we are grafted into the vine and we are separate now God expects that our lives will be lived separate from the world 
That's not easy to do. It wasn't easy for the children of Israel to do. In fact, they got in all kinds of trouble. We've been studying it on Wednesday night through the major prophets. They ended up in captivity. The Assyrians took the northern kingdom. The, the Babylonians took the southern kingdom because they had begun to worship the gods that were no gods at all, the gods of the Canaanites. After tremendous warning through the Pentateuch, but here in the Pentateuch, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 44, it says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. It simply means I'm going to separate you as a people from the rest of the people of all the world. That has not changed, folks. That's us. We're to be separate. If we're going to, if we are going to um, really believe and understand what Paul says at the end of chapter 15 that we can be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord, we need to understand the foundation of this. This comes from the Old Testament. This is where Peter got his idea. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy. Not you might be holy. Not there's a, a good chance you will be holy. If you're in Christ, if you are a believer in Jehovah God in the Old Testament, you're going to end up being holy. It's inevitable. That's the end of the process. You shall be holy. For I am holy. <laughs> you're you're going to be like me. It's like I've said before. My son, Joshua. Joshua, you're my son. You see my big nose? You get a profile shot. It's really big. Okay, you're going to have a big nose. And he does. Now, we're not upset about that. I'm just saying that's not a likelihood. That's what happens. You're going to be like dad. And don't we want, all of us, I do, to be more like dad? Don't we want to be more like our father in heaven? Our father, which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come it's all about him we sing a song it's all about you jesus it's not about me but but see because i've been grafted in i'm now part of him and i'm separate you shall be separate. You shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing. <laughs> A lot of creeping things out there, aren't there? There's some creepy stuff going on in the world. I'll tell you, you know, I, I have to say this. I'm just compelled. Um, I noticed that the flag was at half-mast. I forget when that, about a week ago, Randy put it at half-mast. And I, I kind of figured it out, right? It's the, the death of those people that lost loved ones and are losing loved ones in this coronavirus. And I, I think it's a worthy thing. We, we should fly the flag at half-mast. Half and we do that for many, many times. We get a, a, you know, a mandate from the governor or the state or whatever to fly it at half-mast. And I don't diminish for a second what's going on there, but more people have died from the flu than the coronavirus. I understand the implications of the coronavirus are maybe tricky because we don't understand it all, but what about all the people that died of the flu? It's not just the coronavirus. And then I, I, I said to Randy, and it wasn't tongue-in-cheek, I said, I think we ought to leave it at half-mast until we stop murdering all the babies. Now you think about it, a million babies a year. And these aren't babies that are sick. These are healthy babies. In four weeks, four to five weeks, we put to death more infants in the womb than the coronavirus has killed in the whole population. I'll tell you what, it makes me have righteous anger. We should be outraged, not just the church, everyone should be outraged at what's going on. And I, I think we should leave the flag at half mast until it stops. My own personal feeling about that. But I think it's God's feeling too. For I am holy, neither shall you defile yourself with any of the creeping things on the earth. And of course, he gets into detail on this. He's talking about unclean animals here. But if you go to chapter 19, in verse 2, now he's talking about the moral and ceremonial laws. 
And in verse 2 of chapter 19, he continues with this idea of be, being holy, being separate in terms of morality and the ceremonial laws. He says, I want you to be morally separate. That hasn't changed. Not in the faith that I understand it. He says in verse 2, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. In other words, you shall be separate from these people groups just as I am separate if you're following and believing in and proclaiming and saying that you believe me. In chapter 20, He's talking about penalties for breaking the law. So again, not just immorality, but criminality. Is that a word? <laughs> Criminally. Verses 7 and 8 in chapter 20 says, consecrate. Again, another word that's similar to holy. Set yourself apart. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. Be separate. For I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You say, well, now, Ray, wait a minute. We're under the uh, new covenant. We're not under the law. That's right. We're, our, our Christianity is more difficult than being under the law in the sense that if you break the law, you're doomed. You're damned. It's over. There's nothing you can do. Uh, James says if you break the, the law at one point, it's as if you've broken all of the law at every point. And, and he says here, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I'm the Holy One of Israel. I'm the one who is uh, the, 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 the one to look to to see what that separateness is looks like and then finally in verse 26 in the same chapter verse 26 in chapter 20 and you shall be not you might be you shall be you're going to be holy to me you shall be holy to me for i am the lord and i the lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine wonderful that we belong to him Jesus says at the end of chapter 5 in Matthew, uh, at the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You understand, that's where we're headed. We're headed for this sinless perfection. Turn with me to um, Isaiah, verse 57. And this is interesting because Jehovah God is going to speak to the children of Israel in Isaiah 57, starting in verse 15. He's speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's explaining, here's what this is going to look like. Verse 15 says, For thus saith, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. That, that means is continually inhabiting eternity, whose name is holy. His name is holy. He is separate, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now we know uh, when it comes to humility, Peter writes to us in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He tells us in James chapter 4, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you, draw near. In other words, you will be able to be separate, but you must first submit to God. 
Then we resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In, in, uh, in our reading, in, in chapter um, two, uh, chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, he says this in verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. There's that perfecting again, just like Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father is perfect. Perfecting holiness, your separatedness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, if you look here in Isaiah 57, he says... I dwell in the holy, the high and holy place. This is Jehovah speaking, first person. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. What is contrite? It means truly sorry for my sin. You know, remember what David said, uh, in uh, Psalm 51. You remember what happened? David ended up committing sin. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. He ends up not being able to convince Uriah to come back home from the battle and stay with his wife. So it looked like that, that, that um, he was the father instead of David. He, he, he keeps that hidden for almost a year. Finally, the prophet Nathan comes and reveals and comes to him through that incredible story about the man who had wealth beyond imagination and stole a little ewe lamb from some poor family that that's all they had. And Nathan says, what do you think we should do to that guy? And he goes, kill him. Kill him. Wow. It's pretty severe, David. And David was being convicted, obviously, because Nathan then looked at David and said, what? You're the man. You're the one. But see, what was Paul's, uh, Paul, what was David's response? His response is found in Psalm 51. And he says in verse 16, for you do not desire sacrifice, Lord. He's speaking to the Lord. You don't desire sacrifice. You do not delight in burnt offering. What do you mean, David? That, that's, that's what God ordained. That's what he commanded. We, they had to bring sacrifices for their sin. He says, for you did not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering, Lord. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Why does David write that? Did you ever think about why David wrote that? I'll tell you, I think David wrote that because there was no sacrifice in the Levitical order, the Levitical system. There was no sacrifice for adultery. What was the penalty for adultery? There was no sacrifice for murder. What was the penalty for murder? The penalty for adultery and murder was what? The death penalty. You were stoned to death. That's why, that's why David was shocked when Nathan says, you're not going to die for this sin. David knew that he should die. I'm sure David was prepared in his own mind and heart that I'm going to die for this and I, I deserve it because he was repentant. He, he did have a contrite heart. He did have a broken spirit. But he says, God does not delight. He does not desire sacrifice. In fact, he's saying, you can't even make a sacrifice for adultery and murder because it's punishable by death, by stoning. So David has this contrite heart, this, this, this broken spirit. Well, we go back to our text here in Peter. And what do you do with this? How does this happen? What's the practical application? How does this all work out? Well, we know that um, we are under grace. 
but not under the law. I'm very thankful for that. I'm sure you are too. But we're under the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We talked about that in one of our messages in this last month. We talked about the fact that the grace of God has appeared to all men. We went to Psalm 98. We went to several passages that said everybody is under this curse of sin. Everybody has had this revealed. God has not left anyone out. It says in Psalm 19, he he says, uh, uh, How does Psalm 19 start? (laughs) The heavens declare the glory of God. It says in Psalm 98 that he has spoken salvation to the whole earth. Everybody has that opportunity. But it's interesting because in Titus it says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us, oh, what does grace teach me? Teaching us that denying ungodliness so grace has a purpose (laughs) the grace of God is teaching us what to deny ungodliness and worldly lust in other words to be separate to be holy to denying worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. So we're back to my conduct again. See, because so many people are like, well, I'm under grace, you know, I'm not worried about it, God will forgive me. Well, yes, God has forgiven you by the blood shed by his son at the cross, but that doesn't mean you have a license now to go out and do whatever you want to do. God is commanding us to look at this very carefully. Um, In fact, uh, Oswald Chambers deals with this very verse, and here's what he says. The fact is that the New Testament message embraces a great deal more than an offer of free pardon. And what does he mean? It's a message of pardon, for sure. And for that, may God be praised. Aren't you glad that you're pardoned from all of your sin? But it is also a message of repentance. And I've shared this with you before. I've shared the gospel a lot in my life and since I've been a Christian. And sometimes I forget this. You know, you get so excited, you want someone to come to salvation, and we forget to tell them the bad news. The bad news is if you don't repent, you can't be saved. (laughs) Just plain and simple. It's also a message of repentance, not just a free offer or pardon for sin. It is that. It's a message of repentance. It's a message of atonement, at one being made one with him. But it is also a message of temperance and righteousness and godliness in this present world. In other words, amongst a world that is not godly, that is not righteous, and uh, th- that is not temperate. It tells us that we must accept the Savior, but it tells us also that we must deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. The gospel message includes the idea of amendment. I have to amend my way of separation from the world, of holiness, of separation. Listen, we think of separation like, man, I gotta just stay away from the world. I can't come near the world. That's not what... That's not what separatedness means. Godliness and separation or sanctification or holiness doesn't mean stay away from the world. It means don't do what they do. Jesus didn't stay away from the world. In fact, he was criticized for what he did do. He was hanging around with, you know, drunkards and, and uh, harlots, and, and, but he wasn't doing any of those things that they were doing. He was bringing the message of hope to them. And that's our job, too. We are to not be embroiled in these worldly lusts, in ungodliness. The the gospel message includes the idea of amendment, a separation from the world, of cross-carrying. Now, you heard what I said about holiness. You shall be holy. It's not like, you're going to be holy whether you like it or not. No, no. You shall be holy because I am holy. When it comes to cross-carrying, are you ready? 
It's not you gotta die. It's not like, oh man, I'm a Christian, I gotta die. Now it may start that way, but here's what happens. And you guys know, a lot of you guys know. At first it's like, yeah, I guess I ought to be holy. Yeah, I guess I guess I better pick up my cross and and not fight back and revile like Jesus didn't revile again and entrust this whole thing to the one who judges justly. I get the whole First Peter chapter two thing. No, no, it's after you die to self and you keep dying to self. Your attitude begins to change because of the blessing that comes from God. And it's not you got to die. What is it? You get to die. How's that working out in your house? See, if, if this stuff doesn't work at home, it's never going to work outside. If, if, this, if this doesn't work with your hubby or your wife or your kids or your parents, whoever you're living with, kids, listen up. How are you doing with ungodliness or godliness in your home if it works in the home it works everywhere else if it the hardest place for it to work is in the home why well we kind of it, let's be honest we have this little bit of an attitude of like well you know mom and dad you're stuck with me honey you're stuck with me we're married we're christians we can't divorce so i can kind of i never tell anyone out loud kind of get away with this because we're stuck with each other. We're under a covenant of marriage. So now, I. but you see, how does it work at home? Are you carrying your cross at home? Are you living a separated life from the world at home? Is what you watch on TV separate from the world? Is what you're putting, ingesting, uh, separate from the world? Is Are the things, the way you think in your heart and mind, is that holiness? Is it holiness unto the Lord in my workplace? The place I spend a good half of my life in or a third of my life in. How is it working out with the guy that works next to me or the gal that works with me? How is it working in the workplace? How is it working in my neighborhood? Am I dying there? You see, because when we die and we practice dying, because that's what we really, as Christians, we should be practiced dying to self, right? And when we practice that, after a while, because of the blessing that dying to self brings, we start to say, I get to die. Wow, that changes your whole life. I mean, I get to die for you. That means I'm a servant. We used to sing the song, make me a servant. Humble and meek, Lord, let me lift up those who are weak, and may the prayer of my heart always be in the kitchen, at home, in the living room, in the playroom, and everywhere I live, right there with my family. May my heart always be, make me a servant. Now, brothers and sisters, does that apply to you? I'm talking about little brothers and sisters. I'm talking about you kids. How you doing with that, with your siblings, with your brothers and sisters? Are you dying to self? Are you going, boy, I get to die here. Listen, someone has to die. Listen, someone did die. Jesus paid the entire praise. So that should make me eager for good works. It should make me eager to do good. He says in verse 12 of 1 Peter 2, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works. Can you have evildoers at home? Just say yes. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among your brothers and sisters, among the people you work with, among your spouse and your, your parents and your children, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, people are supposed to see it. Now, we don't go put stars on a refrigerator and go, had a good work today. That's not what it means. It means we have a desire to do good works because it glorifies our Father in heaven. And here it says that these evildoers may, by your good works, what they observe, which they observe, glorify God 
in the day of visitation. I've got to read something to you that um, Oswald Chambers wrote. You know, we talk a lot about our rights in America. Most people aren't talking much about their rights in a lot of countries around the world. When you're in Iran or Iraq or in China or Russia, it's not about your rights. You know, people aren't going, you know, I've got the right for this and I got... They know they don't have any rights at all. And we hear a lot about rights. I want to be happy. I want to do what I want. This is America. I can make myself somebody. I can do something and make something out of my life. You can. But here's what Oswald Chambers wrote. And I think this really hits the mark for the topic as we're discussing it. I really think that this is um, really part of it. He says, and he's quoting from 1 Peter 1.16, You shall be holy, for I am holy. He says, continually restate. Here's some practical information, right? Continually restate to yourself what the purpose of your life is. Now, this is as for you and me as a believer. The destined end of man is not happiness, nor is it even health that I might escape the coronavirus, that I might escape cancer. No, no, that's not the destined end of man. The destined, destined end of man is not happiness. The destined end of man is holiness unto the Lord, to be more like Jesus. Nowadays, we have far too many affinities, things that we're attracted to. We are dissipated with them, right and good and noble affinities, things that aren't sinful, which will yet have their fulfillment. But in the meantime, God has to atrophy them. The one thing that matters is whether a man will accept the God who will make him holy. At all costs, a man must be rightly related to God. And then he says this. He asks some questions. Do I believe I need to be holy? I think there's some Christians that don't even believe they need to be holy. They might not even know what holiness means. Do I, need, do I believe that I need to be holy? Am I, do I, is my attitude, let me serve. Let me do it. I'll take the hit. Do I believe God can come into me? and make me holy? I think that's a problem more than the first question. Do I really believe that God come into me, can come into me and make me like him? Make me separate and holy? If by your preaching you convince me, listen to this, if by your preaching you convince me that I am unholy, I resent your preaching. By the way, it's exactly what it's supposed to do. The preaching of the gospel awakens an intense resentment because it must Reveal that I am unholy. Isn't that what, I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, it reveals to me lots of times that I'm not holy. I'm not being separate the way that the Bible has told me to be holy. But it also awakens an intense craving. God has one destined end for mankind, and that is holiness. In fact, in verses in verse 2 of 1 Peter, chapter 2, he says, crave as newborn babes, crave, the word is desire here, but it means to crave, crave the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What does that mean, to crave the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby? That means that if you really are born of God's spirit, you have a craving for his word. Oh, now I understand that sometimes that, that gets dismissed a little bit. But in general, we have a craving, if we're healthy, for the pure milk of the word. Nobody that has a craving for the milk of the word goes, didn't we do this chapter last week? Nobody that has a craving goes, I already know that. No, believers that have a craving, they, they can't wait to get more of the milk and then even get into the meat of the word. But this is what happens. We have, we have this desire when we really decide, 
I'm going to die. I'm not going to like it. And at first, I'm not going to understand it. But after a while, I'm going to change my position. I'm not going to, I don't have to die. I get to die. That's what I believe God is looking for. Tozer goes on to say this, to be strictly technical, these latter truths are corollaries of the gospel. In other words, doing what those things which will make me sanctified. These latter truths are corollaries of the gospel and not the gospel itself, but they are part and parcel of the total message which we are commissioned to declare. To offer, listen to this, we'll close with this statement. To offer a sinner the gift of salvation based upon the work of Christ while at the same time allowing him to retain the idea that the gift carries with it no moral implications is to do him untold injury. Let me read that again. To offer a sinner the gift of salvation based upon the work of Christ while at the same time allowing that person to retain or keep the idea that the gift carries with it no moral implications is to do him untold injury. In other words, the word of God, if a person truly has embraced the Lord, will change a person. The word of God, if someone has really believed God is going to make them more like his son, Jesus Christ. It's inevitable. It's not something that you strive for. It's something that automatically happens as we draw near to God. Whoever the writer of Hebrews was says this, and this is what I leave you with. Let us draw near with a true heart. That word true actually in the Greek means to be honest. Can we be honest with God? Can I be honest with God? That's the only way I'm going to be separate. Let us draw near with an honest heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Can we let, are, are we able to not only believe but demonstrate that God is faithful by, by allowing that change to take place in our lives as we become more like him, more in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. I believe that that's what God wants us to do. I believe that that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is saying. We can be steadfast, beloved brethren, immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that whatever labor that works us to exhaustion is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we ask you to be glorified in it. We ask you to move on our hearts, Lord. Do more in us to make us like your son, Jesus Christ. We confess to you, Lord, that we are not like you in all ways at all times. But Lord, we ask you to help us to walk in the spirit that we would not then walk after the flesh. Lord, we need you desperately. As we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's our heart. That's our desire. Change me, Lord. Change us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've 
taken me from the mire clay. Set my feet upon the rock. Now I know that I love you. I need you. Oh, my world may fall. I'll never let you go. Father, we do, uh, we love you, Lord, and we pray that that love um, for you, Lord, uh, would just be um, the thing that drives us to die to ourselves, God, that uh, your word uh, would call us to that, just as Pastor Ray just uh, spoke to us about, Lord, that your spirit would um, continue to work in our lives, Lord, as we go about the rest of our day. We praise you for, once again, for the opportunity to gather together remotely, and to continue to serve you um, in all that we do, Lord. We pray that we'd be that light to the world. Um, we give you the rest of this day. In your name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Um, just one last announcement. I forgot about the fact that we are going to be doing um, a question and answer on Wednesday night. Uh, please, if you have questions about anything, it could be about what we've been studying recently. It could be about other things that you just have questions in the Bible about. Uh, make sure you get those questions uh, on Facebook or as an email uh, to the church. And we'll try to address those issues this coming Wednesday night. We'll see how that works out. Uh, so for the rest of you that will be at prayer tonight, we'll see you tonight. Have a great week. God bless. <laughs>